Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship here at Bedford United Methodist Church. My name is Justin Keel, and I'll be leading worship this morning. Pastor Bob is taking a break this week as he prepares himself for our upcoming Advent season. And uh, if you've looked in your bulletin, if you've looked uh, downstairs, it's getting close. As long as 2020 has felt, we are just approaching the Advent season already. We're at Thanksgiving, we're at Advent, we're at Christmas already, and our bulletin is full of things and activities and preparations for those things. Um, some things to uh, note, um, Pastor Bob will be starting an Advent Bible study via Zoom next week. Um, if you're here and want to sign up for that, the sign-up sheet is downstairs. Um, if you are online and watching this, uh, call the church office to sign up. That way we can get you the login information for that Zoom Bible study uh, for the Advent season. Uh, the Christmas card tables downstairs. Uh, fill out some Christmas cards. We're going to uh, help brighten some people uh, here in our congregation and out in the community with those Christmas cards. And the Christmas trees are up and there's some ornaments on it. So, uh, Stacy, do you want to kind of fill us in on that? Good morning. Um, yes, Christmas is upon us, so the tree, actually there's two trees up down in Wesley Chapel, kind of threw me off today, but I have stuff on one of the trees anyway. Um, so we have at this point about 33 kids. I'm missing some forms from some families, slow getting back. I could have up to like 55 kids. Um, so uh, for those of you who are new or watching online that aren't familiar with the program, uh, we help the kids in this school district, in the Bedford Area School District. And so Julie Living Goods here, she's like awesome in getting us the names of these families that need assistance. And then also the guidance counselors at the middle and high schools will help us out in locating families. And so it's just awesome because we know we're reaching out to those kids that teachers are seeing on a regular basis that really need some help. And of course, we all know, like Justin said, 2020 has just been so difficult. And so it's difficult, extremely difficult for these families. So we just want, I, in my heart, I just feel like we need to let these families know that, you know, church is still here. Um, we're still here. We're reaching out in, in the name of Jesus to help out these families and these kids and to brighten their lives. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do our event where we bring the families in. I love to do that the Sunday before Christmas because often these families don't make it to church. So I just love to have these kids come in and hear the Christmas story and, and hear the message. But unfortunately, we can't do that. So we're going to do curbside uh, pickup just like we did for back to school. The families are aware of that. But um, if you know, and I know I've already had people stop by and ask about donations for uh, family members that aren't here that love to help with this program. Absolutely, donations are welcomed. Um, you can even call the church office, see Julie, and she'll make sure that, that that money gets funded to our program. And last year, back to school program, I was a little nervous because I know this was going on then too. And I thought, wow, we don't have as many people. I'm not sure how this is going to work. I must say that we ended up with more money than we needed for the back to school program. So for the first time ever in the midst of the pandemic, and I'm sure we can do that with this Christmas program as well. So stop down. Jeannie and I will be there after church if you want to take. You get first pick down there. So some of you have already signed up. And um, again, those of you watching online, get a hold of Julie at the church office. Some of you have already called me and have your stuff. You're like, these are the coats I have. What kid can I have? So I will come to your house. I will pick it up. I will shop for you. We will make this work. So feel free to stop down and see us. Thank you. Thanks, Stacy. So we've got Christmas trees downstairs. We also have the bell ringing sign up downstairs that still has some open slots. So plenty of opportunities to be involved in this Advent season in the midst of this pandemic. However, we can be involved in our community. That's how we need to share the love of Christ. Also, beginning December 6th, we have a new Bible study, uh, new Sunday school starting in the morning uh, in, our adult, or in our men's class. Um, we want to go ahead and show that uh, preview video. To be a real man, you've got to look back. You've got to figure out what has shaped you and decide what needs to be held on to, what needs to be let go of, and what needs to be faced and reconciled. Did you know why you are the way you are? Why you do the things you do? Have you ever explained you to you?
Good morning. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his presence, to his purpose. Zach Williams wrote a song, There Was Jesus. The chorus goes, in the waiting, in the searching, in the healing, in the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't see it, know it or couldn't see it, there was Jesus. My hope for this study is to help us men understand how our past shape who we are today and hold and have a relationship with Jesus Christ will help us enter into God's best for our future. Like Justin said, the class begins on December 6th over here in the educational building. That would be on the second floor, room four, the whole way back the hall to the step where the steps are on the right. And there's a sign-up sheet downstairs in the North X, and I believe you can also do it online. So I'd like to encourage all men to step into this study. We currently are about finishing one up now. It's a 33 series, which the 33 stands for the 33 years that Jesus walked the face of the earth, and he's our example. And this is volume two of our study. I just felt compelled to stand up here and announce this today. We have a good turnout for the men in there today. For this class, there's like 16. So we can actually almost get too big, but when we do that, We'll figure it out, but uh, just encourage you men to sign up. We all need this. I'm not standing up here because I feel I have my life together. I certainly don't. This, this study is as much for me as anybody else, so thank you. Through the announcement time, let us work on a time of centering here to get our hearts and our minds and our thoughts centered on worship, centered on Christ. So in this time of centering, we'll ask Linda to, to play a verse here, and we will just center our thoughts, uh, getting rid of the stuff that happened last week, not thinking about the stuff that's going to happen next week, but just to be here in this moment, worshiping Jesus Christ. Holy God, be with us now. I invite you to stand as you are able and join with me in the call to worship that's listed in your bulletin. Come, let us worship and bow down. The Lord is a great God. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. Amen. And while you're standing, I invite you to join with us in our first hymn, O Worship the King. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5.
normal, but we can still be in preparation for the coming of our Lord. So with these prayer requests out there, I'd ask you to, to bow your head and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we sit in a time of, of change. Things aren't happening like we're used to them happening. They're not happening like we think they should happen, Lord. But we know that you are in this, Lord, and we just thank you that you have control, Lord. We thank you that you are God of all and creator of all, Lord, and knower of all, Lord. And we just pray that we can trust you even more through all this, Lord. There are many uh, from our congregation, from our community, Lord, that are ill today with a variety of different illnesses, Lord. We pray that the great physician will be in our midst with those, Lord, that you will provide comfort, caring, and healing. We pray for our first responders and our health care workers, Lord, that are on the front lines, um, maybe even a little frazzled, a little tired, a little worn, Lord, a little weary. We pray that you will comfort them, that you will give them strength, Lord, whether they be our, our emergency responders, our emergency medical services, our fire, our police. Lord, we pray that you'll be with them, Lord, and also be with our health care workers, whether they work at the hospital or at a doctor's office or at a clinic or at home care or at a long-term care, Lord, we pray that you will just touch them and be with them as they're in this, this season of um, confusion and, and not knowing what's going on, Lord. We pray that you will lift up our hearts, Lord, as we get ready to have Thanksgiving this week, Lord. We pray that you will help turn our hearts towards Thanksgiving, Lord. Instead of all of the bad stuff that's going on, Lord, we can look at what we are to be thankful for, Lord. And we pray that as Advent starts next week, we can begin to prepare our hearts to celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ, Lord. We just thank you that you are here in our midst, Lord, and that, uh, that you are here with us through all our trials and through all our joys. And we continue to pray with the, the prayer that... Jesus taught us to pray so many years ago, Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now we've reached offering time, a time to worship in this worship service from all the gifts that we've been given from God, all the blessings that we have. We have the ability to worship by providing some of that back. And while we can't pass the plates right now, um, if you have an offering, you can give it online or offering plates at the rear, the side, or the front here on the altar. And as we, we worship with our offerings, I will provide a symbolic offering for the congregation as we listen to the offertory followed by the doxology here and just come to God in our attitude of worship and offering.
Lord, we just thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all that you've done for each of us, Lord, whether it's financial or otherwise, Lord. We thank you for our gifts, our talents, Lord, and we pray that this small offering back to you, Lord, will be used to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Scripture reading this morning comes from Isaiah 41, verses 8 to 13. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant, I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. This is the word of the Lord. So before we get started this morning, I've got a little disclaimer. When I've had the privilege of sharing during sermon time with you before, I've heard several of you tell me something like this. You know what, Justin? It's felt like you were talking right to me. And I, want to get, I have a quick confession. My confession is the words that you're going to hear from me this morning and typically whenever I share during the sermon time are words that I need to hear. They're words for me. My prayer is that these words that I need to hear are words that the Holy Spirit will use in some way to help you as well. So here we go. Have you noticed that there's a lot of anxiety and fear in the world right now? And you know what? I'm not talking about spiders or snakes or the dark. I'm going to say a few words here, and we'll see what happens. These, you know, if if I just say the words, um, election, government, virus, disease, fake news, race relations, social media. Just saying those words, if I had meters on you, I could watch your blood pressure go up and your heart rate increase, right? Just, just as I'm saying that, you know, you, I can sit here and watch everybody start to wiggle in their seats talking about those topics. The world we are currently living in is full of things that are happening that we have never experienced before in our lives, and it's easy to become fearful. And the thing with fear is everybody copes with fear differently. You know, some people cope with fear by withdrawing. Some people cope with fear by becoming angry. Some cope by just pretending nothing's happening and everything's normal. And there's a bunch of other different responses that people can have to fear. But we need to be able to cope with this fear. We need to be able to eliminate this fear because with fear, we as humans have a natural reaction to fear. It's our natural fight, flight, or freeze response. And this response is in us designed to help save our lives, right? You see a snake, it's getting ready, you need to fight, flight, or flee, you know, you need to to do something, right? That's what this response, God put it in us for a reason. But while it can save our lives, spending an extended time in this area, in this state, isn't beneficial, it's not healthy, and it's not God's design, you know, and as we start to cope with this situation, we start using a phrase. I've heard many of you say it, I know I've said it, and it sounds something like this. Boy, you know what? Never been this bad before. I don't know what we're gonna do. You know what, that was actually the original title of my message, it's never been this bad before, but when I started studying God's word and, and preparing for the sermon, I realized, well, maybe it has been this bad before. So as we look at this topic of our fears, especially these fears that we're having in 2020, 
I want to take a pause here, and I want to ask for God's guidance and blessing on this message. So I would ask you to join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just, again, thank you for being here in our midst, Lord. We pray that the words that I say today, Lord, that you will use the Holy Spirit and somehow shape them, that they will speak to each one of us individually this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So back to that phrase. It's never been this bad before. You know, I started searching the scriptures and I came across this, this king of Israel, this, this, this guy that asked God for a bunch of wisdom and then got it. You might remember his name, it's Solomon. Here's what he said about this topic in Ecclesiastes 19, verses 9 to 11. It goes like this. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will, be rem- will not be remembered by those who follow them. You know, the, that, that really struck me as I was preparing for this. Nothing new in this world, and we just don't remember what happened in the generations before us. So I wanted to take a look at my Bible and see how this theory tests out. So I started with some of those fear topics that I mentioned earlier. I started with government because I thought that'd be an easy one. I know uh, many of you know me and have heard me before, so have you read the story of Daniel? You know, I know it, I keep coming back to that, but you know, Daniel lived in this country called Babylon and we can't especially say that the government there was uh, a good government. So he had some problems. What about Jesus' day? They lived under the Roman Empire. We go back to the Old Testament, we had those 12 tribes, they came out of Egypt, and then eventually they had to split into two countries because they couldn't get it right. And how about the Egyptian government that ruled over the Jews in slavery? I think we can see that throughout the Bible, those people experienced problems with the governments that they were in. What about disease? Well, maybe this list isn't as long, but we've got many Old Testament laws that talk about how to deal with people that have a disease, mostly sending them away and isolating them from the population. We also have the New Testament accounts of the lepers and leper colonies and Jesus' visits to these people. And again, they were isolated from the general population. Race relations have always been a problem, even in the Bible. We've got many examples. Think about the Samaritans and the Jews. We've got the story of the Good Samaritan and Jesus and the woman at the well. We've got the Jews living in Babylon. Well, yep, there's Daniel again. We've got the issues between the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Jews, the, Christian, the Jews that became Christians even couldn't seem to get that right to be accepting of the Gentiles. They were having trouble with that. All right, so... What about fake news? I thought maybe this, surely fake news isn't in the Bible. Well, and I was looking, hey, did did you hear the one about Joseph and Potiphar's wife? Man, one little bit of fake news, Joseph goes to prison. Everybody believes it. Well, that's in there too. And, and, And it comes to, why is this important? Well, here's why it's important. I pray that this provides you with actually a small bit of comfort. With all this mess that's out of control, there isn't anything new here. God has already seen it and overcome it. And I want you to hear that clearly this morning. Not just, we're not just going to say God is all-powerful and will overcome this. No, he already has. He's already seen it. He already has overcome it in the past. He's proven that he can do it. So why would we doubt that he can do it again? You know, and that provides a little comfort that there isn't anything new happening here. And God has already brought others through that. But for me, whenever I experience my fears, I really wish God would just provide a description, a recipe, a list, a prescription, something that would just tell me exactly what to do to get rid of my fear. You know, in our reading Isaiah this morning, twice we're told, God says these words, do not fear. Here's one thing I've learned just being a human. Sometimes telling someone not to feel in a specific emotion 
doesn't always, that, that's not always the solution. So let me give you an example. So, you know, just in having conversations with my wife, I've said many times, I think you just need to calm down. Or, I think you're overreacting. And I've learned over, um, you know, 15 years of marriage, that doesn't de-escalate the situation. That doesn't change the emotion. In fact, it actually increases the emotional response. And that's how I feel, personally, when I read these words in Isaiah telling me not to fear. Well, I get my anxiety increase, my emotional increase, because I am experiencing fear, but I'm being told not to. I know that I'm not supposed to fear, but I'm having an emotional and physical response, and I can't control it. Like I said before, you may have realized this, I'm not the brightest bulb. I need some step-by-step direction, so I had to keep searching. I've got some great news. God knows that I'm not that bright. He provides some direction in the scripture of how to eliminate my fear. If we look in 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 to 19, we get those step-by-step directions that I was looking for. It says this, And so, we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. There it is. There's the step-by-step directions that I was looking for, and it's spelled L-O-V-E. There is no fear in love. You know, in my human brain, I think the antidote to fear is strength, is perseverance, is just to stand there and take it and be a man. But that's not what God's Word says. It says the antidote to fear is love. Okay, so... Now I've got it in my mind, I need to fear less, love more. All right, Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love God and love others. What I'm discovering is, you know what? Loving God and loving others isn't just to benefit those others. It's actually beneficial to me to love God and love others as well. When our mental focus and our physical strength is pointed towards loving God and loving others, our fear disappears because we're not focusing on ourselves. So what does this kind of love look like? Well, you've heard it before. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, love love is not proud, right? We're familiar with that verse from 1 Corinthians 9, 4. So those are some things that we want to look at. Patient, kind, not envying, not boasting, not proud, but then 1 Corinthians 9 continues in verses 5 to 7. It does, not, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Wow, just just thinking about those three verses. These three verses could trigger a whole sermon series, a whole series of lessons, and we still would have more to learn and apply about this kind of love. Here's what I know. It's complicated. It's messy. We're going to screw it up. It's got a lot of different angles to it. So how can I do it? How can I do this? How can we do this in this crazy world that we're living in? I want to make this as simple for me and as simple for us as we possibly can. Just do the next thing. Do one thing at a time. Do something. Because if you do something, and you do something, and I do something, and then each of us does something else, soon millions of acts of love have been done. And that's what changes the world that we're living in. You know, I'm a math guy, so this exponential growth of acts of love can change the world. 
Really, we can't sit back and expect the culture of our church, of our town, of our country, of our world to change. We need to be the ones that change. You know, it actually, to me, you know, when I'm thinking about this, it seems a little crazy to be a follower of Jesus, right? Jesus doesn't instruct us to sit and complain about the world around us. He instructs us, he, or excuse me, he doesn't instruct us to be violent or even become angry. He instructs us to love, to love God and love others. And again, as I was looking at this, I, I found something out for me. This others that, that we're talking about here, that includes the others that we go to church with. It includes the others that we work with. It includes the others that we bump into at Walmart. It includes the others that are in our government. It even includes others that don't follow the teachings of Jesus. It includes the others that we don't like. It includes the others that we would consider our enemies. It includes the others that would even want to do us harm. It includes the others that are grateful for our acts of love. It includes the others that aren't grateful for our acts of love. If Jesus taught one thing during his short time in ministry, it's that radical love changes the world. And if you don't believe me, we're still talking about Jesus' radical love 2,000 years later. Changed the world. If you're like me, right now you're saying, okay, Justin, I believe everything you just said. I believe God's got everything in his hands, and I'm not supposed to be fearful. That sounds about right. I believe that I should love God and love others. Yeah, that's, that's right. I believe that Jesus showed radical love during his life on earth. But what can I do? What can we do today to, to show this love? What can we do to work on improving the fact that I want to reduce my fear and increase my love for God and for others? A month or so ago, whenever this topic started rattling around, I heard a sermon on the radio when I was driving to work that kind of put this into perspective for me, so I'm hoping this is helpful to you as well. The scripture the pastor used on this topic was actually Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whosoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. This pastor called this the sowing principle. And the description of sowing and reaping is used throughout the Bible in parables and stories of what we're supposed to be doing. So think of the sowing principle in this way. In the spring, whenever you go to plant your garden, if you sow some tomato seeds, are you going to be able to reap corn from those seeds? Of course not. What if you went and planted some apple seeds? Are you going to grow orange trees? You know, that sounds silly. We, we know it sounds silly. That's not going to happen. So here's the biblical truth that goes with that illustration. We can't sow seeds of division and fear and expect our love for God and others to grow. And just like these plants that we're planting when we're sowing seeds, not every seed is going to grow. So just like that, not every act that we do in love is going to bloom into this big flower. But I'll tell you, if the seed isn't sown, there's a 100% chance that it won't grow. Right? If you don't plant a tomato seed, there's a 100% chance you won't grow any tomatoes. Just like love. If you don't plant love, there's a 100% chance that love won't grow. I want to share a little poem with you. This poem is attributed to Mother Teresa, but it's based on an earlier poem by a man named Kent Keith, and it's titled, The Paradoxical Commandments. And as you listen to this poem, I want you to think of this principle of, of planting seeds. The poem goes like this. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, People may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some unfaithful friends and some genuine enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. The good you do today will often be forgotten. Do good anyway. 
Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. Because in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. So here's my question of the day. Since I know you want less fear because I want less fear, what are we sowing? I think it's time to make the hard choice, and the hard choice always for me is to sow love. It's not what comes natural, it's not what I want to do, but it's what I've got to do. It's the only way to increase the love in the world that we live in. So here's my challenge to you. Pick one thing to sow every day this week. Just one thing. Maybe this one thing that you want to sow this week is just make a commitment to opening doors for people everywhere you go. Maybe it's one random act of kindness every day that you want to do. Maybe it's saying something nice to your coworkers every day. Maybe it's posting something nice on social media every day. Maybe it's not posting what you want to post on social media every day. Pick one thing, one thing, write it down, make a reminder, put it on your mirror in your bathroom. If you're like me, put a reminder in your phone that pops up every day to remind you, do this one thing every day. Again, it's just one thing. It can take seconds to do. It's not going to fill up your time. And after a few weeks, what you'll find is that one thing that you're doing every single day becomes a habit. And then you don't need that reminder. You don't need the pop-up on your phone. You don't need the list on your mirror. And what you'll find is then, after it's a habit, you don't stop doing it, you make a new reminder. Pick one other thing. Put it on a list, put it on your mirror, put it in your phone, and now you're doing two acts of love every day. And you're not even thinking about it. So love every day. Do just one thing every day, and before you know it, you'll be sowing love every day and living in fear a whole lot less. And guess what? This is the perfect time of year to start. Why? Because we have so many opportunities. If you can't think of an opportunity to sow love, we've got a whole bulletin full of things you can be involved in. Thanksgiving is this week. Advent starts next week. We've got plenty of opportunities to show love to others, whether it's the Christmas trees, whether it's the shoe boxes, whether it's the card ministry. We here at the church will help you do that one act if you need that help. Let's choose that love over fear of our surroundings. So as we kind of draw this to a close, I want to give you a quick review. When we start to fear... Number one, it's important to remember that God has this situation. There's nothing new under the sun, and it's all been handled before. It's nothing new. It's nothing he can't handle. Number two, the only way to cancel out the fear that we're experiencing is with love. And number three, the only way we get that love is to sow love to God and others. Take it one step at a time, one thing at a time, and choose to sow love instead of sowing judgment, cynicism, sarcasm, anger, hate, fear. Choose love and see what God can do with that. Amen. I invite you to pull out your bulletin and join with me in the prayer of confession. Forgive us, O Lord. For those times when we do not try, forgive us when we are motivated more by our fear of failure or fear of being judged rather than our faith. Restore to us the joy of our salvation and renew a right spirit within us. Amen. I'll invite you to stand and join with us in our closing hymn, Only Trust Him.
Fear not. You're going to hear that a lot over the next, uh, next couple weeks. You know, Mary was told to fear not. Joseph was told to fear not. The shepherds were told to fear not. So in this season of Thanksgiving and all through the upcoming Advent and Christmas seasons, choose to fear not. Choose it. Instead, choose to sow love. Sow love towards God and sow love towards others. Not just the people we know and like, but to all others. And let God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit drive out all of your fear. Now go in peace and sow love everywhere you go. Amen.